everyone. Welcome back. I am so excited to have my friend Elizabeth Bass joining us from Costa Rica. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for being here. Hi, Beth. Thank you so much. What a treat. So glad to have you taking time out of your busy life. You have so much going on. It's incredible. Um, I love it. So we'll get into it. I just want to let the audience know a little bit about you in case they haven't met you before. So Elizabeth is the author of Heart Medicine, a true love story, one couple's quest for the sacred iboga medicine and the cure for addiction. Bass now serves as an iboga provider with the Misoko Bwiti, within the Misoko Bwiti. Bass is a recipient of a woman in, of the Psychedelic Renaissance Grant from the Psychedelic Feminist Nonprofit Organization, Cosmic Sister, and she's a member of Cosmic Sister's Expert Advisory Circle. She studied at New College of San Francisco when, with an emphasis on art and social change and completed the Transformational Coach Training Program with Being True to You. Elizabeth's Buichi name is Mbai. Am I pronouncing that right? Mbei. Mbei. <laughs> Which means that she carries the sacred qualities of the river. Plant medicines and traditional ceremonies have helped her with healing related to PTSD, childhood sexual assault, self-love, forgiveness, and life-threatening eating disorders. Together with her husband, visionary artist, and Buichi Nanga, a healer, a seer, Chor Boogie, a.k.a. Nyayango, Bass travel. What is it, Nyangu? Nyangu. Nyangu. One day I will get these right. Um, <laughs> Bass traveled to Gabon multiple times where they experienced a Buichi initiation, rite of passage, traditional wedding, and an immersive Iboga healer's training. Originally from California, Bass is currently based in Costa Rica and offers Iboga ceremony retreats with the Soul Central team in a medically responsible way. Bastin Chor helped to organize annual journeys to Gabon to bring people for initiation with their elders, their Buichi elders. And you can check out their links and their upcoming retreats here in the show notes. Elizabeth, I'm so excited to get into this. I want to preface this interview by saying, um, for those that have not been following me for a while, I'm very particular about who I platform as facilitators or retreat facilitators on this podcast or on my summits. And I've known Elizabeth and Chor for many years and in person as well, you know, not just online. And I always say if if and when the day comes that I decide to work with Iboga, it will be with them. So I just mm-hmm. want to preface this saying, I do really trust their their mm-hmm. work, especially with this very sacred and very um, intense and amazing healing medicine. So let's get into it. What is your journey, you know, the, what brought you here to the retreat center, to this medicine? You know, what has your path been all about that brought you here? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Beth. And Wow, yeah, that was the super vulnerable, raw version of my bio. I remember now, like all the things. And it was all those things uh, that started me on a journey that started in ceremony from a very young age in an intertribal native community with different elders that came in to teach us. And it's also part of my family heritage. And long dance, sweat lodge, chanupa, the pipe ceremony. And then that led into many years of plant medicine, starting starting with Aya uh, many years ago and sacred mushroom. Uh, And then I fell in love with this beautiful man. And he was really militantly sober when I met him. And I liked that about him. He was on a path and he had a really big prayer. And then six years in, he had an opiate relapse that was really serious. And I was devastated. I I never thought that would be me, that I would be that person in a relationship and it was something like that, and I thought, it's done, it's over at first. Like, that was my immediate thought. 
And as he confessed to me, I could sense his energy was really different. And he confessed to me. Uh, and I spent time in nature the next day. But in that moment, actually, when he confessed to me, three words came to me that were very clear and it's so much like how Iboga speaks, how Iboga communicates. And it was, it was, I believe, pray, wait, listen, pray, wait, something like that. <laughs> very um, simple words. Just like wait, you know, wait and listen and, and, and pray. And so the next day I was in nature and Iboga just reached up from the depths of my consciousness and said, Iboga, that was it, Iboga. And in that mo moment, and I was in this open state, really listening to nature, I was listening to the trees and listening to the animals. It's that deep state of listening that could allow me to perceive that message, I feel. Uh, and in that moment, I couldn't remember how I knew about iboga or how I knew maybe it was good for the, to treat this relapse. To treat <laughs> Sorry about that. Costa Rica. Costa Rica. I didn't. I didn't know in that moment how I knew it was going to be good for sure. I knew it was good for sure but I didn't know how or why or where I learned about it. It was really a unique experience. And so I, I in retrospect, I, I was in a book I must have read a decade earlier. <clears throat> so I went home and did a lot of research and found that, yes, it can be good for addiction, but I also found a lot of terrifying stories <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of terrifying stories also that I didn't realize at the time that these were people who shouldn't have been handling the medicine or were not holding it in the most responsible, safe way. Uh, but I found my way, we found our way, and it was a process to invite Chur and to for him to accept and for him to be really ready. And it turns out, we have learned, this was his ancestral medicine. And not in the sense of that it's an African medicine, but his DNA goes there. It goes to the Bantu people, who are one of the earliest groups of people to hold Iboga next to the Babongo, the Pygmies. So uh, that's a more colonial term, but Babongo people. Uh, and Babongo, he also has Babongo in his DNA. So isn't that interesting? And I, I felt his ancestors. In retrospect, I think I felt his ancestors all along, but then in ceremony, because I ended up going for my own reasons, the more I learned about it, with uh, my own persevering PTSD, uh, symptoms that were very difficult, despite 25 years of yoga and meditation and therapy and all the things was still there. So I went for my own reasons. And I was, we were, we were hanging on by a thread. I, my only promise to myself was I was going to do everything that I could to get him help, get him there safely, because he also had to have a big part in it. And as I experienced the medicine right next to him, I met his ancestors. And it was like being at the Super Bowl. <laughs> I was like, welcome home, son. And, and it was awesome. He he came home. And, and Iboga is for so many people. It's for earthlings. But it was a special homecoming. Like, you know, when you go home, and your home might be beautiful for a lot of earthlings, you have a special relationship to those cultural roots and that place. And he came home. Mm -hmm. and, and, and not only was he carrying this opiate relapse, he was carrying all of the trauma, multi-generational trauma of the diaspora and systemic racism and all the things. There are so many stories. And all the men in his family, you know, have stories of police brutality, of so many microaggressions, of all the things. Uh, 
and all the disparities, and he came home. And it was so beautiful. And I'm so honored to hold this medicine and to be welcomed by our teachers and supported by the community. I love this medicine so much. It's so profound, the unfolding and the layers and the ways that it works. Detox is one little thing it can do with its pinky finger. This is a medicine really of soul healing and of soul aligned visionary creativity and strategy for so many things, for service, for healing the planet, for art. You know? and people don't realize it's so famous for detox, but it's so much more. That's how I got here. It's, I'm like, I have tears in my eyes because I'm like, when I hear this, it just sounds so incredible, this story of how, you know, it's these, these plants and these spirits just come through for, like, look at this, this planet that we're on, and, and especially here in the U.S. where I live, it's, you know, there's opioid epidemics, there's fentanyl all over the place, there's a mental health crisis, there's, you know, one societal issue after another. I mean, you know, we could do an entire podcast on this. Um mm -hmm. And it's just incredible how it has this this potential, you know, even in like the one the one experience to really change lives. Um, I'm curious, you know, how did how did you guys end up then becoming, um, you know, not just facilitators, but now dedicating your entire life like you've literally left California, <clears throat> which, you know, when I met you a few years ago, I thought you were just going to like do the retreat center in addition to your home. And then I was like, no, no, we're dedicated. <laughs> and, um, you know, you've dedicated your life Tour, you guys go to Gabon, which is also no, no joke. I mean, it's, you know, even in the middle of 2021, I'm like, whoa, that's, uh, that's some real dedication. Um, you know, what brought you onto this path now? And then what is your calling, you know, for the future and, and with the retreat center that you've set up? Like, what is this all about and how did this come about? Sure. Yes. So after our initial healing, there was a very clear call from the medicine to learn more. And this is a very common thing. When people come out of a medicine experience, and want to share it with others. What's very important is how much time do we take for our own integration and, and studies, training. This is a big medicine. This is a very medically sensitive medicine, especially in this side of the world with all the medical histories. And, and people don't realize, you know, microdosing is getting very popular and people don't realize the laundry list of contraindicated natural herbs and supplements in addition to medications and street drugs. Like it's very sensitive. So sometimes people go out there in the wild west of the psychedelic renaissance and start serving this after an experience or two or a handful. And we knew right away uh, not, not to do that. We just had so much respect for the process and so much respect for studying. And we, we went to Africa um, three times for a month journey each and spent a lot of time with other providers in addition to that on site, training, learning, observing, really taking our time. And it's through um, one, one provider, uh, Mark Howard, we spent a lot of time with him and his beautiful wife, Robin Rock Howard, learning, studying, serving, and over, over many years, really, over many years, several years, at least like probably five years. And, and we met um, our co-founders of Soul Centro, Patrick Fishley and Michelle Fishley, two nurses. And Patrick has overseen over 900 treatments of both iboga and ibogaine, so clinical and traditional settings. He's very devoted to the medicine and Michelle, there's so much medicine in and of themselves. They, they really know the medicine, not only medically, but spiritually, psychologically. He also has a background in mental health and addiction recovery, psychiatric nursing, uh, and like ER trauma. He is a living treasure, 
basically, is what he is. <laughs> and he's going to help train other medical professionals so, uh, for this medicine, which we're excited about. So we spend a lot of time learning and integrating, because Tour also is an incredible artist, a professional, international artist and muralist. And so we also had that going on. We also had that. So we worked it in and took a lot of time to learn and digest, simulate. And then he went back for another month, at which point um, we actually moved away from the first healer that we were working with. Uh, and, and his name has been changed in my book. The first healer that we were working with really came up against a tripwire that a lot of powerful facilitators and knowledgeable facilitators came up against, which was the potential to abuse power and to become intoxicated with their own influence. And we saw unethical things. We saw, we saw uh, a way of interacting with women that was, according to us, in our fourth year, we didn't see it right away, in our fourth year uh, of seeing this, and, and at that point, it was a traditional healer. It was very disappointing. It was very crushing. After confronting him, we, we, uh, he, didn't, he didn't really address or acknowledge or take any accountability. There were other things also, other, other ways that we felt there was some unethical conduct uh, financially also. And, and we left. We left. And we actually connected with other elders that so we had met in our first trip to Gabon and stayed in contact with, who are actually have many, many more decades out there in, in that, that, the bush, in, in the culture. Uh, and they really took us under our wing and supported us in that decision and saw what was happening. Uh, and it, it really was very difficult. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been, or people out there have ever been disappointed by a healer or by a quote-unquote spiritual teacher. Uh, it's really hard, but we didn't throw away the the booty baby with the bathwater. <laughs> no, we, uh, we we were really crushed, and yet we moved forward. And so we were working with this. And learned a lot, you know, we learned a lot because there was a lot to learn in that time for four years. And, and at that point, uh, when we confronted him on this behavior, uh, we were no longer, suddenly no longer welcome. And that was fine with us because there was no accountability. So we, we moved forward. And that's the truth. You know, we moved forward. And, and in this last trip to Gabon, the elders ordained my husband, Chorbogi Nyangu uh, Ganga, which is a traditional doctor, really a healer and a seer. He's so dedicated. He wasn't even looking for that, which is interesting. He was there to be of service, and he was there to study, which is why, I think, you know, that was a big part of that. And so solid and bringing other people, uh, and he's so good at organizing those trips, and he's going back again this year. He's going back every year. Uh, to take people for initiation in a really good way, in a really good place. And Gabon is rough travels. There's also certain times of year that are not good to go because of increased risk of malaria and the bugs. But we know the best time of year to go. We have all the, 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 the best gear. The, uh, they're building, actually, they're helping. There's philanthropists that we're in, involved with to help to help support improving the village in ways that they want. That's reciprocity. Reciprocity is not writing a check. It's something we feel very strongly about only. Reciprocity comes from deep, intimate relationship, mutual respect, understanding each other's needs, fully receiving each other's gifts, and sharing knowledge. It's about a relationship. And it's not good always to write somebody a check. You know, it's not always the most helpful thing. That can lead to a lot of new power dynamics in villages and communities that were not hierarchical. So we're very careful about uh, sharing, that it's in a way that we're mindful of our social impact. 
Uh, and we love that. We're helping with um, sustainability and blessings of the forest and other sustainability projects. Really, that's what it's all about. That, that is the true gift. And that's real integration, is to be able to give back to the, this amazing planet and to give back to the communities that have helped us to heal our lives and to love life and to understand life and what life is and to enjoy life. And now Chor and I have a baby. That's integration. <laughs> <You know? laughs> this, this beautiful 16 month old <clears throat> baby Ngadi Nadumu, Flash Boogie Boogie Sunriver, Bolt of Lightning. His name means lightning. He carries the medicine of lightning and thunder and does he ever. He's a boss and he brings so much baby medicine into every situation. What a blessing that he, he wouldn't be here. You know, he's a medicine baby. He's helping to shape the future. He wouldn't be here without this medicine. Mm-hmm. I can, sometimes I think about where we would be without this medicine. We would be a statistic. Mm-hmm. I would be suffering, you know, and, and Troy would probably be dead. And here we are. That's incredible. So, <laughs> it's incredible. That's- that's that's you know it's 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 not a psychedelic fairy tale all the time and it's important for people to know that that working with this medicine does not make people enlightened only you know <laughs> it's quite a, a continuing forever process uh, and and it's an opportunity it's not a magic pill not a magic bullet it, it gives us an opportunity to participate and to take accountability to make choices and have intentions. And it, it will amplify all of that, all of our intentions. I'm so glad you say that because, you know, even when I look into my own um, personal inquiry of the intention of me one day working with Iboga, I've been, and Elizabeth knows this, I've been back and forth and, you know, scared and not sure I need it and what's the intention. And to also know that it's, you know, because when I had first heard about it, you know, a long time ago through someone who used to actually um, facilitate or co-facilitate, you know, he kind of sold it to me as like the magic pill. And I'm like, wow, Mm -hmm. it sounds enticing. You know, it sounds hard. Mm -hmm. Um, But then it was like, oh, well, it tells you everything you need to know about your entire life. And all you have to do is follow it. And I'm like, that's very enticing. But then I've also witnessed people who've come back from Iboga and nothing about them seems any different, you know. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm like, is this really the magic? I don't know. But let me ask, like you, you had mentioned something about this medicine is for, you know, it's like a, a human medicine, um, you know, and, and of course it's starting to get out there more and more into the, the media that this has been known to help addicts, you know, to help the opioid addiction. Um, but who else comes for this medicine? Like, is this, like, do you feel that this could help shape our entire planet on some level if we got let's Mm -hmm. say like world leaders and ceos like who's who's coming to your retreats you know like what what are the majority of people coming for sure yes i love this question and yes it's so not a magic bullet it really is this sacred opportunity Uh, so all different kinds of people come and we have many people who are really I would say generally well people or people who have already done a fair amount of healing and self-development work uh, healing core traumas uh, who want to be super well who want to live at their highest potential and service to humanity so there's a lot of people like that, uh, and and high functioning people uh, like CEOs and presidents of companies, and I've seen firsthand how medicine work brings people like that into a place where their eyes are are opening to issues like sustainability making sure what they're doing is as sustainable as possible for the earth, for society. uh, They become more geared towards social profit, 
rather than uh, private profit, you know, like how much good can we do uh, in addition to living a really good life abundantly? And, and a lot of people who are dealing with severe trauma, severe trauma, and and that's such an honor. You know, people who are dealing with some of the most intense trauma I've ever heard of from a war and child abuse, child sexual abuse, um, all kinds of things, and, and even depression and anxiety conditions like this. And by the way, the Buiti know a lot about trauma. Sometimes... You know, people will ask, like, well, shouldn't you have a therapist on site, you know? <laughs> you know, this is a long-acting medicine. This is a 48 to 72-hour medicine for a lot of people. With the medicine so present, deep in this, like, psycho-spiritual surgery. Uh, and, and I can't tell you how uh, potentially, like, dangerous it could be to have someone in there tinkering around with the psychology if they are not fully informed about this medicine and not a Bwiti initiate with, as we're in a Bwiti container. You know, the Bwiti know a lot about trauma and it's a different way. And they've taught us, so a big part of holding the medicine is also counseling. There is traditional modalities for counseling that are profoundly deep and nuanced. I, I, it's hard to even begin to like, it would be unbelievable really to share some of the ways that we've learned to support people and to see what's happening is magic. It's just magical. Um, so we, we hold people in this space with a lot of counsel. So it's important that you know when people come to us in this Bwiti ceremony that to, it's important to know that they are coming to a Bwiti ceremony and it's not Western psychotherapy. And sometimes there is some um, unconscious bias around uh, the superiority of Western modalities. Um, so that's important. You know, we work with people before they come. We have a preparation workshop. We have a lot of dialogue. We have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a lead facilitator before people ever get to us. And, and so we help them to understand the container, which is all by consent. You know, once people arrive, everything is by consent. They, taking the medicine is by consent. Participating in the council is, is by consent. But it's such a special opportunity. So people, very high-functioning people, artists, creative people, uh, and sometimes people will come to understand like the next step in their uh, in their professional expression and their service. Um, it's really amazing to see the relationship between medicine and, like you know, Beth, you know, between medicine and business is profound. But it's important to know that Iboga lays out a curriculum for people. It lays out a pathway that sometimes people discover they have a lot of core healing work to do that maybe other medicines didn't touch maybe 30 years of psychotherapy didn't touch, that is still affecting them. And it's important to work with those things before the medicine can deliver this other intention for this uh, professional fulfillment. You know, it, it goes in this perfect curriculum. So it's really great when people understand to be open to the pathway that the medicine guides them. Yeah, and, and we get that a lot. You know, we get uh, people who have been through 30 years of therapy and they're still needing help with something. And other medicines, like myself, you know, I went through a beautiful, almost a decade of work with Aya. And I'm so grateful for that. It helped me with so many things, with self-love and forgiveness and heartbreak and like so many amazing things. But there was still lingering trauma like residual effects, PTSD symptoms. There was still that there. And despite all of the yoga and all the meditation and all of the practice, I didn't realize how much more there was to up-level my relationship with my own mind. And for me, Iboga 
has been, and for many people, the ultimate medicine for the human being mind and to understand how we are using it to our fullest potential uh, or how we are using it to our own detriment, you know, to looking at our thoughts and how do we become an artist of our thoughts. And that doesn't mean making stuff up that feel good, like affirmations. It means really seeing the truth of what's happening around us and how we create narratives that aren't entirely grounded in reality or limiting beliefs, how they're not entirely grounded in reality. And so we see what's real. So as people who want to up-level their relationship with their human being mind, I didn't realize when I first came to Iboga how addicted I was to resentments and to worries. Very addictive, some of those things. And, and almost like an OCD revisiting of resentments and worries and uh, imagining the worst case scenarios. Some of us are very good at that, right? Just always, you know, worrying. And Iboga just shined the floodlights on the basement of my mind and let me know really what was going on in, in excruciating detail, but also the impact. Every thought is sacred. Every thought. So I really learned that like every thought is sacred and has ripple effects into the world. So I'm really grateful to this medicine for that. It's the most psychologically complex medicine I've ever encountered. That's what I was so, I was actually going to ask about that is um cuz you know like it's interesting I've worked with ayahuasca or psilocybin a lot and um you know it's definitely helped me see some of that like okay my patterning and you know like the the repetitiveness or the limiting beliefs or you know revealing more of the truth versus the way I've been operating um I've definitely healed some serious core wounds and trauma and you know that's ancestral trauma that's been passed down but you know of course it's like the onion layers there's there's always more there's always more how how does iboga work different thing, differently than ayahuasca I mean is it um I mean obviously you know, there's a different spirit, it's a different plan, it's from a different region of the world, but like, how does, how does one uh, explain the difference between the two, let's say, if that's a, if there's a way to even explain it? Say that again, to explain the difference between? Between um, like the iboga healing experience and let's say like psilocybin or ayahuasca, uh, you know? Okay. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, one guest said that the iboga journey is like 100 ayahuasca journeys in one night. That's what one guest said. Hmm. I think that's well put. So there's different functions of the medicine that are so distinct, and it really does work in these layers of detoxification. And so there's different uh, phases, right? So uh, Aya can be so many things also. For me, it's a very feminine spirit. It's a mother. It's a lover sometimes. You know, Aya can be a, a fierce mistress also, you know, for sure. Very confrontational in her own way, but very feminine. And uh, psilocybin is very different too. And also psilocybin at three grams is very different than psilocybin at seven grams, which I experienced at one point, which was a complete melding of all time and space into unity consciousness, <laughs> that was really great. So, so there's a lot of differences in experience and dosage, you know, that also, and tradition. And even in Aya, there's many variations in the brew, in the tradition. So I, I, it's hard to summarize exactly, other than it's a very feminine experience. And for me, Aya was very physical initially, feeling my entire body and even the inside of my body and my digestive tract and uh, very visual, very emotional, so much about the heart, more about the heart for me um, and forgiveness, so much about learning what authentic forgiveness is and self-love, self-love um, uh, and a much shorter journey. You know, for sure, time length. And Iboga, at first, so 
first there is the detox and everybody has a detox. I came in a 20 year vegan, loved all the green drinks and it kicked my ass. Like I've purged seven times at least in my first journey. It was big physical purge, but also a mental purge. We call it the mind purge. And the mind purge is where you see all the contents of your psyche spinning like a hurricane around you, everything that you've ever seen or even imagined, spinning at a thousand miles per hour so fast you can't even try to analyze or hold on to any particular thing. You just have to rest in the middle of it. Like that's the advice, to sit really in the eye of the storm and just observe the nature of your mind and everything in it. And I would say like 95% of people who come to Iboga experience that. Isn't that an interesting function of the medicine? It's this mind purge. Uh, and sometimes it can go for 12 hours. In my, after my first journey, I almost never wanted to touch that medicine again. It was the Olympics of meditation. It was mind purge for 12 hours and seeing the most bizarre stuff I've ever seen. And it was all in there. It was like the visual expression of all my fears. And, and, I, and I had the message at the end of that journey, no, I'm going to receive all that this experience has to offer me. And so I, I, I went into the second journey, which was totally different. It was an avalanche of beauty for me. And it's different for everybody. Some people have two difficult journeys. Um, but in the second journey, I had no purging at all. And it was very clear. And it was all of this beauty, the beauty of creation, the beauty of nature, the beauty of love. I saw Chor and I getting married, which at that point I thought I was pretty close to done with him. But I saw us getting married. We were in this deep healing process. Our relationship was very toxic. So I, I saw a premonition. And, and that is one of the functions of the medicine. The medicine has many traditional functions, which would be an, an interesting topic. Um, but one of them was premonition, but not in the way that it's anything is written in stone. You get to like look behind door number one. Okay, if you go down this path, where's it going? And you get this like divine carrot on a stick. Like, okay, you want to go here? This, this is what it looks like. And thank God, because it's really difficult sometimes on the way to fulfilling your dreams. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of challenges. Um, so you get to see what's down the path um, and see what's coming sometimes. You know, Chor saw a vision of his mother's death. Mm. You know, and, but how beautiful. When the Iboga shows us that, like she, she died within about a year. And, and how beautiful that he could be fully ready wow. and, and fully present because he was present and he was clean for her death, the most sacred of transitions. And he was supporting her mm. and and to know the preciousness of life. Sometimes when Iboga shows us those things that are very difficult, it's teaching us the, the sacredness of life. So I digress. Wow. Anyways, so, so there's the detoxification. And the Bwiti say you need to be clean to enter the spirit world. And the spirit world is often where we visit ancestors. Sometimes that's appropriate for people, not always. Uh, and to receive a lot of answers to our questions. This is another thing that brings people to Iboga. So questions, we receive answers to these questions that are very dear to our hearts and important for our, our journey on earth. Uh, and we receive healing and insights, all the gems. And we have to get through a certain level of detox in order to get there. Sometimes people get a lot of those gems on the first journey. Sometimes people, there's some people who need three or four journeys. Really, they talk about this as like a you're fixed medicine, and that's not true. Sometimes when people have been through a lot of addiction in the past uh, or a lot of trauma, they definitely need some, some more deep ceremonies. So the questions is something I wanted to mention. In the origin story of Iboga, Iboga shared with one of the first people to ever experience the medicine, uh, the second person, both were women in the beginning in the story as we perceived it through the Nusobabuti, the medicine introduced itself and said, hello, 
I am the spirit of Yaboga, and I have been watching you humans for a long time. And I have been listening to your questions, because you love to ask questions like, what is my purpose? What is life? What is the key to happiness? What is God, or who is God? So we love to ask these questions, and Iboga said, I have come to answer your questions. And what that speaks to me of is a long love story of co-evolution and how this plant bioengineered itself to answer our questions. And right now, so the core questions like trauma are the beginning of our healing ourselves. And then we have the big questions like, how do we heal climate change? And that's where we need to go after we heal our core trauma, that it's not this like entropy of self-concern, but that's what this medicine can help with, especially when it gets into the right hands and the right body, (laughs) that there are people making a difference, that are making a massive impact because they can ask those questions. And it's brilliant. You know, the, the, the neurogenesis with this medicine and the neuroplasticity is beyond any other medicine I have experienced of all the big ones, the most common, like, they, like you know, and they're all helpful with neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. But this medicine is so fascinating. There's, there's veterans in preliminary studies now showing remarkable healing after traumatic brain injury or the brain injury that can come after deep addiction. So that's that's why, like, this is a creativity medicine, like visionary creativity. How can we heal climate change? How can we become 100% not only sustainable, but regenerative as a society of human beings? I'm like freaking out because this is this is my vision for the world that I'm like, look, if these medicines are coming out, into the world in a bigger way. There's more and more interest. I mean, it's no coincidence that these medicines are coming through at this time in history when it's like we're faced with so many issues and it's kind of getting Mm -hmm. to that point. You know, I mean, everybody's heard this. It's like, you know, the next extinction, the glaciers are melting, the, you know, the whole entire um, jet stream is changing. I mean, there's, these are not small feats. And every time I feel into, you know, plant medicines and psychedelics and this whole world and the evolution of how it's coming so fast, it's like, well, my prayer is that hopefully, like you said, it gets into the right hands and we can come up with some of these solutions or ideas or maybe it comes through Mm -hmm. and maybe, like you said, it's like the healing as above, so below, the healing of ourselves and our own Mm -hmm. personal, you know, ancestral traumas and DNA and all this energetic imprints and these patternings that we're carrying it's like when we do our own work, then, it, you know, hopefully it has this exponential effect. But here is my question. This is where I struggle personally. <clears throat> and I, mean, I know a lot of other people in this realm, you know, we, we go back and forth with this where there is this demand on earth for healing. Like there's so many more people, right? There's, there's mm-hmm. crises, mental health issues, addictions, trauma, you know, all mm-hmm. I feel like and all humans. Issues. Yeah, yeah. But so there's a, there's a need and a desire, but then, uh, you know, how do we keep it? um, Like, let's say the desire to go work with Iboga or ayahuasca or anything. And then there's the sustainability and the over harvesting and the indigenous communities and the inappropriate facilitators that aren't actually holding safe space. Mm -hmm. How do we get this in a balance? I mean, this is the point where it's the demand to me is growing so high and then, you know, and this is why people maybe go into facilitation that shouldn't be, or people uh-huh. are selling iboga on the internet, you know, inappropriately. Oh, <laughs> but so how, dangerous. You know, it's, yeah, please don't buy it off the internet, please. Um, no. How do we, what is the solution for this imbalance of the supply and demand and the um, uh-huh. right relationship with this? Oh, thank you for bringing this up. It's hard. Um, yeah, yeah. Right relationship. Well, I'll start by saying that we're doing it right now. That what you're creating with your podcast and with your questions, we are part of that solution. Coming into right relationship, talking about reciprocity, 
talking about sustainability. Sustainability is so critical with this medicine. It takes seven years just to grow to minimum maturity to be medicine. And not only that, but like plantation medicine is very different from like the kind of medicine that we are grateful to receive through our sacred relationships, which is uh, grown in its indigenous environment and, and sustainably harvested and ceremonially harvested. So much love from these strong plants, you know, and the indigenous environment gives it a lot of strength. We need to nurture that indigenous environment as well, support deforestation, support environmental protection, go to Gabon, you know, write their politicians, be involved, support Blessings of the Forest, which is a wonderful organization for sustainability, to be active because, you know, Iboga gets stronger when elephants come along and tug on the roots because they eat Iboga. So it increases the alkaloid content, which is something we learned from Yan of Blessings of the Forest. And the ants they have in their indigenous jungle kind of bite it, bite at it and make it stronger. And that's what it teaches us to do, to be stronger, to be resilient. So we must protect the environment. We must give back to sustainability. Uh, and please don't buy a boga off the internet because it can also be from elephant poachers. Related to elephant poachers is something I learned from Jonathan Dickinson, who wrote a marvelous article like at the crossroads of the jungle and the laboratory, um, that he details a lot of that. Um, yeah, it can be from elephant poachers. It can be adulterated. I've heard so many stories. It can be weak. It can be the wrong cardiotoxic plant. Don't buy it off the internet. You don't know who you're dealing with. And what's the energy that it has absorbed? It's, it's a sponge. It's an amplifier. So... If we're treating the medicine like a commodity, from buying it from people who treat it like a commodity, that's like using someone for their body. And what happens when we treat medicine like a commodity is we become the commodity in our own lives. And that's not a life I want to live. So that's what right relationship is all about, is everything comes full circle. Uh, and. And I want to also give a shout out to uh, talk about innovative, <laughs> creative technologies. Laura Don has uh, envisioned and helped to create this app called Grow Medicine, which features vetted sustainability projects for ayahuasca, iboga, uh, I believe five and yo, uh, and even mushroom like it's it's very it's all like culturally sensitive vetted projects you know the money's going in the right place and it's also um, in partnership with the indigenous medicine conservation fund who uh, like David Bronner is one of the people involved in that so what a beautiful project grow medicine <laughs> you know <laughs> we just pull it up on our apps and support but yeah, we won't have iboga if it keeps going with this consumer mindset. Consumer mindset is killing the planet fast. We need to be in reciprocity mindset. Not just sustainability, reciprocity, regenerative mindset. How can we help give back more to nature than she gives to us? Right? That's how we're going to live. And it can happen. You know, it's, it's really amazing uh, what can happen. And this is... So this is a very, for me, oh, here's another thing to mention in, in, in the comparison of different medicines. So Aya shows up very feminine. The Buiti say that Iboga is mother and father at different times. And I have felt that. I have felt that a lot. The different um, masculine and feminine parental energies, <laughs> you know. And for me, this medicine shows up more as the masculine, probably because that's what I need <laughs> in my life. And, and it is a stimulant to the central nervous system. It's very much a spiritual warrior medicine. And after the initial layers of detox, it helps us to hunt our own destiny and hunt our own life. It's a hunter's medicine in that uh, traditionally, they'll take it in microdoses when they're out hunting in the jungle for, for long periods of time. 
just in not only physical endurance, but spiritual endurance, not only physical focus, but spiritual focus. So if we can get on target to this sustainable, regenerative world, I'd like to see that. Spiritual warriors and helping us with our own mind, because when all of the neurosis is gone, and by the way, I am not plagued by those that mind anymore. I have, I have a different relationship with my mind. So when all of that stuff, all the self-doubt, insecurities, worst case scenarios, and I'm too busy being present in this moment, that you can hear the inspiration in a way, not hear auditory, but like you can perceive inspiration. You can, you can be busy instead of worrying about things, like how to make things more beautiful, how to help specific people. I spend a lot of my time thinking about people and what they need and how to help them and what, how to make something more lovely, how to just move through and be resilient and get shit done in the best possible way. Like it's a lot of time and energy that you can have once you've gone through some layers of detoxification of mind and body and soul to be busy with other things and the bigger questions that we need to be asking right now, very high level people need to be asking. That's so beautiful. I mean, it's like, imagine, imagine all the time and energy that would be freed up if you didn't have this, like, you know, the rumination in the mind and how many people suffer just from being in, stuck in the loops of their own, what I always call like your own personal drama. You know, and I know this from my own experience of many, many years ago when I started my last business, I would spend days, you know, upset over some failure, you know, and it would take me down. And now if there's mm. a failure, it takes me down for like five minutes, you know? And then you it's like, busy. yeah, like, well, it's like now, now I can serve at a higher level because things process through so much quicker. I mean, it's taken years and years and years and years and years, but, um, you know, this is just so beautiful to think like, yeah, as humans on a planet in crisis, we do really need to spend that precious energy and time, like putting it towards, you know, service, creativity, helping, giving back, and maybe not just ruminating in your stuckness of limiting beliefs and um, fear and whatever it is that's holding humans back from really rating their light and giving back to the planet. And that's kind of... Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I say. Like my prayer is these medicines, you know, any medicine really, it's like, yes, we're all doing it for our own healing and growth. But then there's there's always this larger collective in play at play. We can't ignore it, you know, and it's like, okay, maybe if we come into all this medicine with this intention, we can see large scale changes. And I think it's happening, it's gonna happen. It has to happen. It's you know, like the light will always prevail. At least that's my optimism. But, um, but Elizabeth, I want to give some time to talk about this because, you know, as people are listening, including me, I'm sitting here going, well, like, yeah, I am a spiritual warrior. I do want to serve. Um, I do, if, and when this medicine, it's time for me, you know, I would want to do it in a safe container with the right facilitators, with someone mm -hmm. who's studied and also really holds it in, um, you know, in the traditional path, like that's a big part of my own path. I've always, everybody I currently work with is extremely traditional and to, you know, like where the medicine is from and holds it in this, you know, this, this way of the ancient, the ancient way of our ancestors. Um, so how can people work with you? Like, what is it that you guys are mm -hmm. offering? Sure. Who is it for? Who is it not for? And how can they learn more about, you know, what you, you offer to your guests? Sure, yes. And, and just to add one more thing around the right relationship, you know, with uh, unethical providers and, and these things, which are so unfortunate. You know, I hear stories. By and large, so much positive and, and even miraculous results, outcomes. Uh, but community is really key. Conversations, forums, like, you know, even you have a forum, like communicating about positive experiences and investigating when you hear of a not positive experience. You know, really investigating. And prohibition has got to go. Like prohibition is a tremendous obstacle to safety because a lot of people who survive something, if they're in a place where it's not entirely legal, 
they uh, feel vulnerable legally, like they're exposing themselves legally when they they report a, a bad provider, so an abusive provider, or it's in another country where they have no rights. You know, so so prohibition, continuing to make educational media, you know, really investigating your providers really well is really important. Asking them what is your code of ethics? Who are your mentors? How many ceremonies have you sat in? Like, who who, who holds you? Who's your like? Uh, your, who who holds you accountable as peers? You know, like these are important questions. Um, so how people can work with us, <laughs> and and we love that. You know, we love all these questions, and really excited to publish. We're about to publish our code of ethics that we've been work, working on. Um, so soulcentro.com. We're actually about to launch a new site, which might be out by the time that this podcast is out. But until then, it goes to a landing page on my site with information about our retreats, with all of the details. So Soul Centro, spelled S-O-U-L, Centro, C-E-N-T-R-O, dot com. And you can click any button to fill out an inquiry form and have a conversation with our wonderful team member, Natasha who will talk, walk people through uh, an initial complimentary consultation to see if the medicine is appropriate and listen to your needs and see if, um, how we can best serve. And then from there, people go through a whole in-depth, comprehensive medical and psychiatric screening with our nurses, Patrick and Michelle. Uh, that goes really, really deep into all of the medical conditions and medications people might be on. And also, <clears throat> we don't work with people in acute detox. We help people through a custom program that we call Pretox to help prepare people for this medicine, which is safer and it's more integrated and at better long term outcomes and more gems, more of the good stuff, the insights, everything. So, we have this amazing program with a lot of different modalities and other medicines to help prepare people and also working with people in, and their medical professional to help with responsible, safe weaning of their medications if that's needed and appropriate. So we go through a full medical screening and then people visit us in Costa Rica. We have a goal of about 20 retreats a year. Each retreat is eight days and two ceremonies. And we're out here in the Nicoya Peninsula. It's beautiful, charming a hotel here, space that we have with beach access and so much lush jungle and wildlife and nature all around. And, and then we also have like a, a preparation workshop and a free monthly integration call. There's many, by the way, if it's helpful, many informational resources on the Aboga page at ebast.net and integration resources also. If you scroll down on that, a lot of articles, safety articles, safety information. Uh, and yes, I'm super happy to be serving this medicine. And, and it's really, really incredible. You know, when people come ready and willing because the medicine shows us what the work is, but it doesn't do the work for us. Right? Uh, and, and it's very confrontational. I mean, it's the magic mirror. You ever seen that movie, Never Ending Story? <laughs> the guy has to go up to the mirror and like walk through the gates. Like that's what it is. Like we really have to face ourselves and face the truth about life and how we've been living life. But then when we go through that, everything is possible. So much is possible. Because then we, we can make real decisions based on reality. So yeah, that's how people can work with us. Oh, and in the future, so we have secured land uh, near, nearby where we have our current space that we are developing a long-term vision and we are welcoming people who want to be involved uh, we are welcoming angel investors and people who want to see uh, not only a lucrative opportunity but really holding this medicine in the most effective possible way with long-term stays on-site pre-talks with things like IV nutrient therapy, combo, infrared technologies, float tanks, acupuncture, ozone, um, 
amazing food. Food is medicine and integration stays and farming on site. And uh, there will also be a limited number of spaces for community uh, to have a private residence there. So a, a beautiful, beautiful piece of land with like spring water there and ocean views and, and really holding this medicine uh, in so it's holding this medicine, but other medicines, like sometimes we might have a wachuma ceremony when people are in pretox, with a lot of breathing room, preparing for iboga, because the cleaner iboga, like the cleaner people come to iboga, the more fruitful, more safe, all the gems, the more they get from the experience. So, so this bigger vision and, and the integration and creative arts. You know, Chor will have his art studio there, creative arts, sound healing, uh, writing arts from me, helping to support that, you know, visiting um, teachers as well. So that's the bigger vision of where we're going. Sign me up. I already told Elizabeth this. I'm like, sign me up. I'm in. Oh. And it's the best of all worlds, right? We'll have community from Africa coming and also being in reciprocity with Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. There's seven indigenous groups here and we have already <coughs> served uh, a, quite a number of scholarships to Costa Rican citizens Beautiful. and will continue to do so. That's a big part of our mission is giving back to Costa Rica. Also. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing this work. Oh, it's it my such joy. An honor. <laughs> I'm going to have to have you back and have you on the summit because this is a, you know, it's come up a lot. The last, I mean, I'm sure you know, I know, um, Iboga has come up more and more and more over the years and it's, you know, there's more of an expressed interest is the education and the stories and also, you know, the depths of where people have been and gone. It's like there's a breaking point and people are like, I mean, including me at some level, there's, you know, there's always this like one little thing or this one little trauma that just doesn't seem to go away and clear. And, you know, it's like, I mean, of course it's, it's there, it's my friend, but you know, this this path and this medicine, I do believe, has a very important place in our future. And it's also really um, to be held with high, high level facilitators with high level, um, you know, reverence. So that's that's why I wanted to give you this platform. This is why I've also turned down uh, other providers who've reached out to me where I'm like, you know, what? I don't really know you. I don't know the work, you know, it's, this is not to be taken lightly. So I'm so glad mm -hmm. you were here to mm -hmm. share this. I really appreciate it. We'll have all the links, including actually we'll, we'll link to that, um, education page on your website that you mentioned and integration resources. Thank that you. Is... Thank you so much Thank for being that. here. Such an honor. What a joy. What a joy. <laughs> Thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you.